Hey guys, Chris here. Today I'm at Fort Churchill State Park. It's a historic state park. And we're gonna be talking about what happened to Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and how they actually died. There's some different stories and even historians can't agree on exactly how they died and what happened to them. But we're gonna talk about that. And we're gonna be camping in the pop-up camper tonight. It's gonna to be really cold, but uh, I got a, some firewood and the buddy heater and a steak. That's next. So this state park has remnants of eight, an 1860 fort that are like adobe remnants. And this fort was around from 1860 to about 1869. And there's still remnants of it sitting out here in the Nevada desert. And I'm right now I'm heading to the campground that's along the Carson River. And that's where we're gonna be spending the night. But yeah, it's fairly remote out here. It's got a really remote desert feel. And it's still winter, so <laughs> I'm uh, dealing with very low sun and uh, it's dropping fast. And we had snow just last night and the night before, so we got a lot of snow out here in the desert. Not a lot of snow, but there's three, three like three inches of snow. And it's gonna get down to like maybe like five degrees tonight. <laughs> so I am gonna be buried in the bottom of my sleeping bag to ride this one out. But I thought it'd be nice to get out and uh, the days are gonna get longer and the sun's gonna get warmer, so it's gonna be all good, so. I guess any site will probably do. They all look look pretty good. Uh, I think I'm going to be the only one here. <laughs> I think I want one that just pulls right straight on through. This looks perfect. Seven. Actually, that's my birthday. August 7th. Perfect. We'll go with seven. All right, I wanted to uh, check out the river before the sun goes down and I found it. I ran into a barbed wire fence and I couldn't get around and I just followed it and then I, I broke through, so. But it's kind of cool. Oh, there goes some geese. I spooked some couple of geese up. <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> They're like, hey, we're just hanging out here and some weirdo shows up. <laughs> Anyways, there's a railroad trestle right here. That's pretty interesting because it's part of our story with the uh, Butch Cassidy and the train robberies. So anyways, we'll be talking about that later. I just can't even hardly hear. I hear a little bit of bubbling up that way. Just really quiet, very interesting. Also, check this out. See this behind me here? These are uh, beaver, beaver cuts. You can tell because, because you can see the, the gnaw marks, but these are really fresh right here. Check that out, look at that. So this is definitely beaver country and it's just clean. So this, this could be in the last couple weeks or something. It's just so, 
so fresh like that, but yeah. In fact, there's probably a, a beaver dam, uh, maybe down there around the corner. I see a log pile up here too, so. March is uh, coming up pretty quick here, another week. And so, looking forward to spring. A little more daylight, more heat, less snow, more options to do my camping, history, just getting out. Makes me, uh, makes me feel good just getting out, getting out of the house, doing my adventures. Anyways, time to get the uh, fire started and the heater going, so. the setup and we got the uh, stove here but I'm having an issue lighting the stove I can't get pressure to the uh, fuel tank and I got my thumb over the uh, the hole here and stuff but I it just I got it really close to lighting and it was the flame was on and it just went stay on anyways that's not working and my uh, mr. buddy heater I had a tank here on the side I thought this was a brand new one and because I had two of them and I used the other one last time I went camping. I thought I put the new one on. Turns out this one is empty as well. So I blew through two of them. So now I don't have a heat source. So things are kind of coming apart on me. <laughs> I'm feeling a little frustrated right now. And uh, camping in the cold can, um, it can be uh, kind of dicey if you don't have everything working properly. Fortunately, I brought some firewood. I got a good sleeping bag. And worst case, I just hook up the pop-up and get out of here. But I'm gonna see if I can make it work. I have my backup backpacker stove, which is so much easier to work with. One of these, I'm, these things are so reliable, the little stoves. And I got my pocket rocket here. So I think I can pull this off, get my dinner pulled together, get the campfire going, get warmed up, and I can crawl in my bag and make it through the night. while I'm cooking. Samplers. <sighs> kind of a disaster tonight, I gotta say. <laughs> Not having my buddy heater and the Coleman stove. I'm fine with the Coleman stove, but the buddy heater, I don't know. I'm gonna have to crawl in the sleeping bag and get through this. <laughs> I am looking forward to the warmer seasons, I gotta tell you. It's gonna be nice. It's gonna be really nice. Cheers. <laughs> that is gonna be fun. <clears throat> Waking up, it's sunny when you wake up, it's already starting to get warm, and uh, you don't have to have heat sources to stay 
warm just kind of dress in layers and and uh you don't have to look at this <sighs> i'm doing this one way or the other this food is nice and hot mm -mm. this is really good I think next time I'm going to add a few more vegetables, maybe even cook up some rice, and just make a, a, a full stir fry. Steak stir fry. There we go. <laughs> At least we got a good blaze going here. <laughs> uh, this feels good. Feels good. You have to be halfway in the fire to feel it, but it feels good. Yeah, as soon as I get some embers, it's going to help out a lot. So, not too bad. Not too bad. So on the night of June the 2nd, 1899, near a small town in southeastern Wyoming called Wilcox, Wyoming, which is just north of uh, Laramie a ways, the engineer of the Union Pacific Overland Flyer was heading for a small uh, ravine with a train trestle in it, and he noticed two men with lanterns holding them and they were masked and they were w flagging him down like there could be an issue like maybe <laughs> the bridge is out and the ravine is just waiting for him to go into so he slows the train down and one of the guys gets onto the train and puts a gun into his ribs and tells him to stop the train and then they stop the train and they get out and then there's other guys waiting and this is at 2 a.m. They're waiting for them and they have them detach uh, one of the cars from the passenger cars. And they get the car across the bridge and they're trying to get into the car and the person inside of it won't let them in. And so they take a couple of sticks of dynamite and they blow open the door. And then the guy that was inside, his name was Woodcock. And this is really interesting because it's very similar to the movie, but it's it's different and so then they find the safe but the guy that was in the car is dazed and he can't give them the combination so they put more dynamite and they put a bunch of dynamite to blow the safe open and they blew the crap out of that thing and it just destroyed the train car and there was literally bills and cash and even coins that went up into the air all over the place and they made off with $36,000 that night and then they took off and went back into Wyoming somewhere probably heading to Hole in the Wall but the, the word got out and there was like a telegraph message put in and the Union Pacific Railroad had a special train that they dispatched from Laramie up towards Wilcox. And this train had uh, Union Pacific detectives, but it also had the Pinkerton detectives, which were a private detective agency. And these are the guys that had, on their logo it said, we never sleep. And there was a big eye, kind of an unblinking eye at the top of like their letterhead. And that's where they came up with the word, uh, the phrase, private eye, for the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And they were very um, persistent, and they were well-paid, 
and it was like this last resort for the Union Pacific to like, we have to stop Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch from the robberies that they're doing. They took it personally at a certain point and they, all the money they lost and the time they lost and the cars they lost. So they dispatched a special train seven hours later, 9 a.m. the next morning and this train showed up and these guys got off with their horses. This special uh, had men and horses with rifles and they got off and they got a posse together, a local posse, and they ended up with like over a hundred men that were pursuing Butch Cassie and the Sundance Kid through Wyoming to try to finally track them down and get rid of them, essentially. They don't want to just catch them, they wanted to get rid of them. And so Butch was on the run again. And at, at this time, he had also robbed another train near Tipton, Wyoming, and he robbed a bank in Winnemucca, Nevada, which is not too far from where I live, uh, in Carson City here. And at this point, Butch had really felt the pressure of being pursued because this robbery got out. It was became the most famous train robbery in the West. And it was in all the papers out East and the word, it just became like legend. And this, this detective agency was just determined to get him. And then the Union Pacific was like, had had it with these guys making a mockery of them. And so Butch decided he needed to not just get out of the state, but get out of the country. So his plan was to go to Bolivia. And Bolivia at that time was a very wild place. Very remote. Uh, you got the Andes there, which are huge mountains. The Southern Andes. Argent uh, Argentina was north of there. And that's where Patagonia is. And these are these high plains, high mountains, very remote and it's very it's like Wyoming on steroids is what Bolivia was and, and still is and so their plan was was to go to Bolivia and just get kind of start a new life so before they departed for Bolivia they went to Texas for a, for a time to, to clear out of Wyoming and they were hanging out and they were drinking and womanizing, whatever they were doing, just kind of living it up because they had a bunch of money. And this money was very traceable though. It actually even had uh, like gunpowder on it that they could recognize. And then the detective agency, the Pinkertons, had the serial numbers figured out and so they could tr kind of start tracking them where they were. They were very sophisticated for, the, for their time. And they had a famous picture of the Wild Bunch uh, at this photography studio and it was it was actually kind of a um, from what I remember kind of a um, to mock the, win the people in Winnemucca they were they they were gonna send it to them but it was in celebration of just having a good time and the the owner of the photography studio put it in his window to display it of one of his works and then a Pinkerton detective happened to see that and then they used that picture on wanted posters because it showed all of the wild bunch in one shot and so they could like literally zoom in and figure out which ones if they saw them somewhere so that was on a, a wanted poster and so they knew they needed to leave um, once they they saw started seeing posters of themselves around and so they the rest of the wild bunch did not go with them to Bolivia and Butch and Sundance and Sundance's girlfriend at a place went to New York for a time uh, just like the movie very interesting and they took a steamship all the way around from New York to South America and then Bolivia and then they worked their way into Bolivia and they bought a ranch down there a very large ranch a cattle ranch I had some sheep and they lived at the base of the Andy Mountains beautiful country I think it was the Rio Blanco River they were near there and they lived there for like five years 
before the Pinkertons once again caught up to them. But before they caught up to them, they had been living this life and they were uh, pretty happy and content down there in Bolivia. They were accepted as being part of the locals. People saw they were hardworking people and they just, uh, they just accepted them. <laughs> but, but he had been staying in contact with his family back in Utah, Butch had been. He wrote a postcard, I believe to his mother. It was intercepted by the Pinkerton Detective Agency and they could see a return address on that. And so now they went, oh, we know where he is now. And this was sometime in the winter, so they had to wait for winter, but they sent some detectives down there and they had to wait until the snows cleared to send the people out there. And Butch and Sundance got wind of this, that they were uh, in pursuit again. So they left for Argentina, which is north of Bolivia, to get off their ranch because they knew that they were gonna be trapped, that you're going to be captured there. And at a place at this point in time in history, she disappeared. It's believed that she was brought back to uh, New York by Sundance. And then she, there's different stories about what happened to her, where she went, but she was never really to be heard from ever again. And she, she may have changed her name is what they think. But then Sundance came up and he, he hooked back up with found Butch, hooked back up with him, and then they robbed another bank up in Argentina. And somebody was killed during that robbery, and this time the locals had heard about these two gringos that were, uh, had pulled us off this bank heist, and so, and then somebody was killed, and so they're like, you know, not making a lot of money, the the locals, the farmers, and they're, they're, these guys are worth, I think, like $3,000 a piece. And so they, people were looking for them, and they really stood out down there as well when, when they're wanted. <laughs> Before they weren't, everybody wasn't uh, privy to who they were and what they were, their background really was. So they were, again, uh, in pursuit, and they robbed the payroll of a mining company. The, the burrow that they, they had, they actually took a burrow from the mining company, had a brand on it, and the brand, somebody recognized that brand on the burrow, and the burrow was parked in front of this house that they had, uh, were using for a few nights to uh, lay low, and then they alerted the cavalry, there was a local cavalry that had been patrolling the area, and they surrounded this house. And Butch Cassidy had heard uh, somebody come up to the door, and it was one of the um, policemen, one of the local policemen, he knocked on the door, and then they opened up the door, and they, they just killed him. It was the first time Butch apparently had killed somebody, and then the, the soldiers opened fire on this house and there was a gunfight for a couple of hours. And apparently Sundance was shot several times in the arms and Butch had been hit at, I, I believe at one point as well, had to been. And then all this shooting for a couple hours and then all of a sudden it got quiet and there was no more shooting back from the house and they waited and then they heard a couple of a, a couple of screams and then they heard a gunshot and then there was a second gunshot and then it was quiet again <sighs> and they uh, they went into the building they found these two men Sundance had his arms had been shot up and then he was shot uh, between the eyes, and then Butch Cassidy was shot in the temple. Pretty gruesome, and it looked like a murder-suicide that they, that's how they ended their life. But these guys were buried in an unmarked grave. There was no relatives 
that had come down or anybody to identify to positively identify them and so they were buried in unmarked graves in San Vicente which is where this this house was where the gunfight was and in San Vicente uh, apparently <laughs> they they couldn't identify them and so now after this happened the uh, family thought for sure that was them but there had been reports that there was two other guys that had robbed, uh, done some robberies as well down there. And so there was some confusion about re what really happened. So most historians believe that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid died in this shootout in 1908 in Bolivia, in San Vicente. But there were stories and rumors of stories and even eyewitnesses who claimed years later to have seen Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. So that would have meant that they had somehow escaped from this harrowing situation in this small hut in the uh, Bolivian foothills. Uh, one of them was his brother and Butch's brother and sister had claimed in 1925 that they had seen him that summer and he pulled up on a Model T and he visited with them and reminisced with them. Uh, he had also uh, appeared to some people in Lander, Wyoming near the uh, Wind River Range and he had been living there, I guess. Uh, th and this was years after this shootout. And people had talked, uh, had, had talked to him and he said he had hidden some loot up in the mountains in Wyoming there and he was looking for that one summer. And people uh, were listening, heard stories from him. Uh, there was also a um, husband and wife team in 1991 who were, I believe, scientists. <clears throat> and they went to San Vicente, Bolivia, and went to this grave site and they exhumed uh, these two graves that they believed were Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And they did DNA testing on their remains, the bones, that would be the only thing left. And it was inconclusive. It, it was not positively identified as being from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And even though they had uh, enough samples to match it from the family tree or whatever. However that works. I don't know how DNA sampling works, but but that was inconclusive. There was another story in Washington where he had lived in Washington until he died in 1936. This was 28 years after this shootout. So, so the, there's some stories that throw the whole thing into doubt, but this all happened because in San Vicente, after this um, gun battle with Butch and Sundance and the Bolivian army. It wasn't just cavalry; it was the Bolivian army. Um, they just believed that these were, these were the two bandits that had robbed the, uh, the bank payroll from this mine. They didn't know, they didn't realize that these two were the most famous outlaws probably in the world and from Wyoming and they were Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. They didn't, they didn't know that's who they were so they just put him in these unmarked graves and had they known that they would have surely made you know news about it take lots of photos and and bragged about it or whatever and people would have probably came down there to get pictures of them who who knows but they didn't know that so they just buried these two bandits that they took care of and in a grave and <clears throat> off they went. So <laughs> it threw the whole thing into doubt and, uh, and the family was never able to identify them. So really interesting. Most people that are outlaws like this, they just, they're tracked down and they're a, there's a definitive end uh, and they, they ca they're captured or killed or they just completely disappear, I guess. But uh, so anyways, this is really interesting. Um, yeah, it was fun. It's been fun talking about this in this two-part series with uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance. All right, well, I am going to head to bed here, and I'm going to get into my sleeping bag and stay nice and warm and uh, get through the night here. But it's a nice, calm night. A lot of stars going on. It's great. I just love this. See you in the morning.
Good morning. It is really cold today. It says it's 11, but the location changed. I got a couple different locations that keep popping up and it was six degrees just a few minutes ago. So <laughs> it's cold for me anyways, but yeah, the sleeping bag worked great. Uh, I stayed really warm. It's amazing how warm I stayed in the sleeping bag. The Kelty Cosmic Down 20, but other than that, it is freezing. I'm going to get some coffee going, and we're going to do a quick uh, little look at the uh, the fort over there. But I'm going to come back here and do a uh, a tour of the fort, and then talk about the history of this this place. This is an awesome place here. And I have muffins. <laughs> My yogurt's frozen, so I can't can't eat that. This is funny. The um, the phone now it says Silver Springs, and then when I go like 20 feet that way, it says Dayton, Nevada. So it's it's tracking my location and it's changing it based on what part of my campsite I'm at. <laughs> That's pretty funny. But yeah, it says it's eight degrees, so. That's gonna change. All right. Anyways, we're gonna take a quick look at this uh, park, and like I said, we're gonna come back here, so. So there was no military presence out here. There was really not much law out here in 1860. So the U.S. government set up this fort, Fort Churchill, in 1860. It lasted until 1869. Then they just abandoned it. But it was here to watch over, protect the Pony Express in the early 1860s. Also to uh, have like a presence and to help out with the California Trail and the immigrants and the people that were on the immigrants. The immigrant trail, California trail, heading obviously to California, up to Oregon, and the there's a stretch of it that goes right through here, uh, the California trail, as well as uh, uh, there was skirmishes with the Indians that obviously lived out here. Also, in the, during the Civil War, uh, con the Confederacy wanted to take over Virginia City, which is like that way because of the silver that they were producing there and so they had to deal with that as well so once the railroad got set up and they didn't really need this fort out here anymore so they just abandoned it and sat abandoned for decades and decades until the early 1930s some people got together and tried to maintain this place Nevada stepped in and established it as a state park, Fort Churchill State Historic Park. So, yeah, we'll go to the visitor center and check it out next time I come out here. So, all right, you guys. Hey, thanks for watching. Um, it's been a it's been a good little trip here, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. And as always, keep hiking. <laughs>